Seltuk in the morning. Our journey begins in a town between two worlds. In western Turkey, 75 kilometers south of Izmir, where Europe meets Anatolia, arises this fascinating provincial town. Seltuk's popularity today stems from the famous excavations at Ephesus, a well-known tourist attraction. In ancient times, Ephesus was one of Anatolia's most important cities. Its zenith began in the 6th century before Christ. But it's not only the historic setting which brings the hordes of tourists to this area. The idyllic Aegean Sea is also a favorite destination for a great many travelers from all over the world. Infused with the oriental feel of the hospitable Turkish culture, the town of Selçuk offers something for everyone. One could be forgiven for thinking that there is nothing new to say about this region. But just seven kilometers from Selçuk, beyond any tourist trail, lies a world unknown to us, whose traditions are very much older than the tales of the Arabian Nights. A morning with the Chetankaya family of Yorick nomads at the foot of the Kechi Kalisi hills. Mustafa Chetankaya steps out of his family's tent, one of the largest Yorick black tents in western Turkey. For at least 5,000 years, black tents have accompanied the various nomadic tribes of the Middle and Near East, North Africa, and Tibet, as they travel the sparse deserts and hills in search of pastures for their livestock. The black tent, made from goat's hair, has special qualities. It is rain and storm proof, can be heated by open fire, and in hot regions, it is cooler than a modern tent. In the desert, the air temperature inside can be 20 to 30 degrees Celsius lower than outside. This technology, which ensures the survival of the nomads, has been gradually improved upon from generation to generation for the past 5,000 years. And so we find here a legacy running through human history. For the very first time, we are going to film the construction of a traditional Yoruk black tent, a rare opportunity to experience a dying craft. We asked the Shimshek family to call together the old tent makers from the surrounding area to build a black tent one more time. Our interest in their culture was much appreciated and after a year of preparation and planning, the project could begin. Mehmet Shimshek is the Turkish project leader the building of a black tent requires him to carefully organize several families, as this project should not detract from their daily agricultural work. During discussions about filming times, materials transport, and tent dimensions, we are able to enjoy the famous hospitality of the Yoruk nomads. Evet. Tamam. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet. Evet
Just how does a black tent create a cool interior space? The secret lies in the weave of the tent roof. On hot, cloudless days, this dark, coarsely woven goat's hair fabric bakes in the blazing sun. The black weave absorbs the full spectrum of the sunlight and converts it into heat energy. This heat then significantly warms the air just above and just below the skin of the tent. Because this layer of air is constantly hotter than the surrounding area, and since hotter air always rises, the heated air flows up and out through the rough pores in the fabric. In this way, heat is perpetually dissipated from the interior of the tent. This principle works even in the hottest of desert regions. Yoruk black tents always have the same construction shape, but can vary in length, width, and height. So the dimensions must be established from the start. We decide on the smallest possible tent. The next day begins very early. After giving the animals their morning feed, Mustafa Surgun and Mehmet Shimshek set off with us to the weaving villages in the distant hills to obtain the fabric for the tent. Still you keep me We are warmly welcomed. The exotic TV team speaking its own curious version of Turkish arouses great interest. We are led to the local weaver. Mehmet Shimshek and Mustafa Surgun know that the coming negotiations are critical to both the quality and cost of the tent. The weaver, Adnan Yarar, is a highly respected man in the village. And an expert haggler. Bu çadır, tamam. Bu çadır. Bu seni denk geliyor. Şimdi baş metre. Bak bunlar bunlar. 27 değil mi? 27. 27. Kaç siz 50 vereceğiz? 5 yerden 10. 6 üstü yapac
Bu Sen kaç... çadırın yüksekliği ne kadar onu söyle ben. Bu kaç metre ya? Abi 27 metre. 27 metre. Bunlar şimdi tamam, 27 metre. Top etiyor bize. Bunlar 27 metre şimdi. İki, i̇ki tane, iki, iki tane üst üste eklediğimiz vakit 5, 5, 10, 10 yaptı. 5, 5, 10 yaptı, 20. Kaldı 7 metre orada. 7 metre. O 7 metre sizi veriyor. Ha. Ha. İki tane de bundan alacaksınız. Ha. Öyle hocam. Ha. Şuna, şunu da yendir oğlum. Senin kafasını orada çalışsın yani. Siz ekleyeceksiniz o zaman. Ha, ben, ben, tamam. ben size düz kanat çekeceksiniz diyorum. Ha, düz kanat diyeceğim, bizim ekleyelim. Tamam, o zaman az. Oradaki şeyi de alayım. Ağabey abi, bir şu tane de geri malın üstünde. Şimdi bunları çekelim. Çekeceğiz biz ama fiyatını diyor. Fiyatını nasıl çekeceğiz? Fiyatın nasıl nasıl çekeceğiz? çekeceğiz? Ben her sene gelirim buraya amca. Her sene gelirim biz, biz kendimiz alıyoruz. Yani biz o önce... dursu vardı. Ona siparişi verdik eskiden. O şey er tezgahındı. Ha er tezgahındı. Sonra sonra böyle azalma başladık. Mesela şimdi şu mallar birinci kartı. Bunlar kırkı mal. Anladın. Şu go verdim buraya. Atı verdim. Onlar kilosunu yedi milyondan veriyoruz. Bunu. Bunların kilosunu beşten veriyoruz. Çok abi ya, sen ne diyorsun ya? Arkadaşlar 800 orada verdi de. Nerede? Koyda. Şimdi ben 800'ü verdi. Geçen sene gerçekten 800 iyiydi. Evet. Şu andaki durum iyi değil. Yani gerçek bu yani. Kıl diye çok da almıyor. Ya, almıyorum bak. Ben şu da şey geçen seneden 3 tane yakın kıl aldık. Bu sene eridemedik kılı. Yani o da bir buçuk ton durdur. Ama ben size şöyle bir şey var. Madem ki maldan böyle şey edeceğiz, hesaplarız. Önemli değil. Ben kılı da bir milyona veririz arkadaşa bir sene diye düşünüyordum. Gerçek, ya, gerçekten yok. Gerçekten yok. İstersen bak en Bilmiyorum. sağlam bu da patron var. Patronu götürsen dahi yedi vereceği fiyat e, ya elli fazla olur ya elli aşar olur. Ben şimdi onu ne diyorum? Tamam sek, sekiz yüz alalım. Senin kantar var mı? Siz de bari buraya kadar geldiniz. Kantar var değil mi? Bak bak. Hadi. Hadi. Biz arkadaşlar bunlara yeri mi gördük? Yok, bizim ona her sene gelir bunlar. Evet, her yıl gelirler. O zaman geldiyse sizin arkadaşınız bizim arkadaş oluyor. Evet. Biz dedik böyle böyle gideceğiz, onlar bize diyor, biz de gidelim oraya. Hatta onlar arabaya da geldik. Abi gazır var mı? Ne için? Hı? Gazır var mı? Yok yok. Gazır yok. Gazır yoksa. Anıl da sen ne oluyor ya? Ya o para yerine <gülüyor> 58 mi bu? 59 mu? 55. Şey 60. 60, 60 kilo gazır lan. Boş ver. Ga ga gazır lan. 60 kilo. Tamam. tamam. Kola mı ne de 60? Kolanın Kola çok, çok pahalı ya. Gerçekten <gülüyor> çok pahalı. <gülüyor> Bildiğiniz gibi değil. Ben attı zaten de aynı verme. Kolanı vermek <gülüyor> istemiyorum. Neden biliyor musun? Çünkü ben dokunuyorum. Ben dokunmuş olsam hiç fark etmez. <gülüyor> Ondan ben para kazanmayacağım. Aldığım gibi sizi vereceğim yani. Ben de kola birini sana alayım. Sen ne kadar alabilir miyim? Tamam gidiyoruz. Hadi ha baba baba. After these tough negotiations, once again the villagers naturally invite us to drink tea. But we're soon on our way to our next waypoint, as we still have plenty to do. The next port of call on our journey is Tira. In this town, famous for its handicrafts, we hope to have the tent's apex piece and tensioning spars constructed by a carpenter. A simple enough desire, but a long search. Eventually, we find the carpenter's workshop we need, and the young craftsman throws himself into the unusual task. While he works, we use the time to buy ropes, mats, and pegs for the tent. Hadi sen 
Our shopping done, we wait for the carpentry to be completed. It's getting late, so we load up our purchases and set off for our last stop. The idyllic village of Akmetlikoy is situated near where the Shimshek and Surgun families have their tents. Some relatives live here, former tent makers, who will help us with our project. These days, the families have settled in houses, as it is no longer worth traveling. They tell how, 35 years ago, the last family in this region stopped making the annual trip to the legendary trading center of Afyon. Fearing we may not have bought enough fabric for the tent, our hosts cut away a section of a 40-year-old tent, a family heirloom. This is not at our request. However, for the Yoruk nomads, it is natural and indeed absolutely necessary to do everything possible for a guest. But now we must wait patiently for the day to come when the tent will be built. A good chance to freshen up and savor the atmosphere of daily life, Turkish style. The day before the great tent construction, we visit the Shurgan family as they milk their goats. Part of the goat's milk is brought to the neighboring Shimshek family, where the grandmother and grandfather are getting ready to make cheese. After the milk is filtered, rennet is added, the milk is stirred, and finally the tank is closed and put to one side to rest overnight. The next morning, the cheese is ready. A perfectly timed breakfast for the tent makers who are gathering to stitch the tent today. The work must be done very quickly. As past midday, the summer heat in this area can become unbearable. 
Although this is the first time in 30 years that a black tent will be built, everyone knows just what to do. Step by step, the skin for the tent roof is laid out on the ground according to its cutting pattern and then nailed down. Although literature has often described the construction of a tent, today we are learning, for the first time, the most important secret to correctly building a black tent, how to stretch the fabric panels. It is only by striking the tent panels that the fabric can be stretched by 15 centimeters and pretensioned so that it will be able to hold its shape. A tent which is not pretensioned will never withstand a storm. Once the stretched fabric panels are nailed down to the ground, the collective sewing can begin. The sewing stitch used is called the yuruk stitch. It ensures that the tent panels are joined so that they butt up against each other and that later the weave will not strain unevenly when subjected to high tension. In areas of low rainfall, a cording seam is used instead, but in this region it is found to be unsuitable as it tends to collect rainwater and allow it to pass through the tent roof. In contrast, Yoruk tents are rainproof. The tent cords are attached across the fabric panels to support the tent at the points of maximum tension. Mehmet and Aisha Shimshek, today's host, make sure that the group wants for nothing. Work materials, water, tea and cigarettes are regularly distributed. We help too, and on Mehmet's request we go to some family friends to fetch an umbrella to shade the workers from the increasing heat. There is another sewing detail to watch out for. The fabric panels are also tensioned at right angles to the seam, calling for extra strength when sewing. Now the end points of the tent are also tied, and the three tensioning cords are finally stitched on. When the tent is erected, these cords will pass over the apex to rest on the three tent poles. At 76, Grandfather Shimshek is the oldest active tent maker on the team. For him, today's tent building brings back memories of bygone days when the Yorick were still able to travel. Once a year, he would travel 400 kilometers east to the legendary trading town of Afion to sell his wares and handicrafts. But for 35 years now, the family has no longer trodden the old trade routes, and little by little, the tents have been replaced by houses. The tensioning spars are now sewn to the end of the tent cords. It is already 11.30 and the temperature is climbing ever higher. Today it will reach 45 degrees Celsius in the shade. Gel, 
Kolay gelsin. Tamam, 18. Tutacağız orayı. Başla, başla, başla. Kalın ya bunu. Bunu çok kalın. Yedi miydi? Now the tent poles are cut to the right length and fixed into the apex piece. Thick braids fasten the tensioning spars to the front and rear sides of the tent skin. Although the tent skin is still lying on the ground, the guy ropes are already tied on and cut to the right length. Every tent is different, with its own unique characteristics. The Yoruk nomads know its subtle details and are straight away able to find the ideal dimensions for every individual tent. The tent roof, the principal element of the tent, is now ready and no time is lost in setting it up. Still you keep me cool. A black tent and its ropes are fully pretensioned while still on the ground. It is then raised up by its poles and can immediately stand by itself. This approach means that one person does not need any help from others to erect the tent. Now all that remains to do is finally tighten the ropes and tack the tent skin. As soon as the tent roof is up, it provides a far cooler location in the midday heat than the umbrella. And while the side walls of the tent are worked on, a party atmosphere starts to develop.
Our new tent has been made partially using modern methods. But what was the production process like several decades ago? We wanted to get to the bottom of this question, so we asked the Chetankaya family to take us right back to the roots of tent production. At the very start, the Kashmir goats are shorn and their hair is sorted by color. The hair is collected in large sacks. In the past, the family themselves processed it into raw wool and then spun it into wool yarn. These days, the wool is sold directly to the weaving mill. The Durabai family shows us how the wool would be spun into thread. The drop spindle is the world's oldest spinning tool, and its small size makes it ideal for a nomadic lifestyle. To make the yarn, the thread is doubled up and twisted together a second time. We are told that Grandfather Shimshek, the oldest man in the tent making team, is also a master of this technique. High up in the hills, in the weaving villages of Bozogan, hand-spun yarn can still be bought, and its quality is particularly highly prized. The efficiency of the spinning wheels in the weaving villages leaves our Western European hand spinning wheels standing. Here, the wool is worked into double twist yarn in a single process. In the wool sack, there is combed, unspun wool which simply through the skill of the women is already almost in the form of thread when it emerges. Before spinning, the wool must be processed again so that the threads may be turned with a fluid and uninterrupted motion. The Taker family of weavers explains to us what happens before spinning. At delivery, the raw wool contains a mix of different cashmere goat hair types. These different types must first be separated out. And here's how it works in practice. The raw wool is laid out on the combing machine's pickup tray and is then slowly taken up by rollers.
Many fine tooth rollers distribute the wool evenly across the width of the machine and separate the kemp, the coarse outer wool, from the softer down. The downy hair, the valuable cashmere, is expelled from the middle of the machine, whereas the coarse kemp hair is taken from the end of the machine as a fine fleece. Naturally, the same happens with the black wool. The soft down, which can also be seen in the coarse kemp fleece, has a light gray color and is an equally valuable cashmere. This coarse hair kemp fleece is sorted according to color and stored in sacks for further processing. Of course we wondered how the wool was processed in the past without the help of combing machines. With the help of current hair production for brushes, one of the older weavers shows this to us and asks his wife to demonstrate the combing process to us on her day off. Yani bunu üretim maksatla bu yıllarca belki siz daha önce söylediniz. Once the yarn is spun comes the next step, the weaving, which Adnan Yarar will demonstrate in more detail. This hand loom is one of the most ergonomic in needlework today. Despite industrialization, hand-woven fabrics are still highly valued, thanks to the gentle treatment of textiles that are worked by hand. When we ask if there are any even older versions of this loom, Adnan Yarar leads us to a neighboring house, where the last weaver using a vertical loom works. This is very old. You said 800 years ago. The wall is işte 800 yıllık dayıma işi bu. Bu 800 yıldan beri bu devam ediyor. Bir ben varsam bir de bu var tezgahta. Başka yok. Başka yok. Yok. Bana biri yok sen Türkçe. Aa, biliyor biliyor. O az çok O zaman otururuz ev vardı kahvede. Böyle kahve içsin ne yani? Kafe istemiyor orada belki başka şeyler. Olur olur. Şeyler var. Su. Yok yok koli koli. Even we are surprised to be able to film a vertical loom like this, as we believe they had all been consigned to the history books. Bunların adı da bu uzun ağaçların ismi. Bak, bunlar girin. All the individual elements of this loom are lashed together by cords. Fabric from this loom is superior to that produced by modern looms in both evenness and durability. It is thus highly prized by specialists. After our glimpse into the past, let's pass the wool drawing in the sun and come to the modern era of mass production. This factory building supplies black tent fabric to Arabia and North Africa. Business is booming. In Saudi Arabia, for example, fashion dictates that along with a luxurious home and the latest technology, an opulent black tent should be standard equipment for any well-to-do family. The machines are 35 years old and come from Germany and Italy. Our factory visit answered any remaining questions we had about where black tent fabric comes from. 
We have now experienced every possible step in the process of creating a black tent. All our questions have been answered. Once again, we pay a visit to the Durabai family, who were our first contact seven years ago, before we had met all the other Yorick families in the valley near Selchuk. After a hard day's work, relatives and friends of the Durabai family turn up at the tent to see us one last time. Family friend Mustafa Gular defines for us once again the essence of the black tent. Yoruk çadırları kıl keçi kılından yapılır. Eğrilir ip haline gelir. İpten sonra e, dokumaya verilir. 4-5 kanat üzerinden yapılır. 3 tane direk olur. Orta direk biraz farklı olur. Hoş geldiniz. Ee, Hoş buldunuz. Şey, orta direk biraz şey film çekiyor. Biraz yüksek olur. Ee, çadırın direklerin üzerinde ağaçtan yapılmış iç oyuk çanaklar olur. Onlar olmazsa zaten şey olmaz. Ee, stilleri ağaçtan çivilerine yan taraflara gerilir. Akmaması için genelde içinde ateş yanar. Ateşin dumanları is dediğimiz e, yağlı dumanların şeyi çıkarken süzülür. Yağmur içine almamak için. The Yoruk black tent, as we have seen it today, is rapidly disappearing from the Turkish landscape. Modernization is pushing a cultural legacy into the background. But thanks to our visit and our interest, our hosts hope that there will be a place in the modern world for the tradition of the black tent. İnşallah Avusturya halkına, Türk halkının geçmişten nasıl geldiğini, nasıl yaşadığını bir kitap haline getirir, Koran'ın halkına öğretir. Biz de bundan bir Türk millet olarak gurur duyarız. Birkaç yılda bir gelir, misafirimiz olur. Kristina ve eşi Harvard. Ya, en iyi şekilde ağırlarız. Gezecek yerlere götürürüz. Ee, biz de bundan mutlu oluyoruz. Still you keep me cool When it's hard